the future is here. It very much is here. Um, here's a, an interesting story of uh, two young women that I knew in their preteen years with some terrible neurological disorder that none of us could figure. Uh, I did all the biochemical genetics things I could do at the time. They became young adults. They exited the pediatric system. They didn't come back. About a year ago, the wife, sorry, the husband of the, sorry, I gotta get this straight. These two girls have a mother and a father. But this mother has a cousin, and she's married. And they have a child who's three. And dad thinks that she has what they have. Don't think so. But he approaches the medical genetics people, and uh, they say she's got something. But I think the only way to answer that is uh, to do exome sequencing. So he gets on the blower, he gets a hold of Gene DX, 5,000 Canadian dollars, bang, diagnosis. And it's treatable. It's an inborn error of vitamin B2 metabolism, which is treatable. So the two-year-old, three-year-old is now on treatment and improving. We're about to start when I get back treating these two. And there are time and time, there are stories now appearing frequently in the New Yorker magazine about families who've done the same. Or they see a geneticist and who calls them up three or four years later and says, you know, we've got this experimental thing called exome sequencing. Do you want to participate? Bang, diagnosis. So much so that the American Society of Medical Genetics, American College of Medical Genetics meetings in March, I think in Utah, there was a whole half day on, on exome sequencing for newborns. So that's, that's the future, and that is coming. And then finally, getting back to my interest in neurogenetics from these repeat diseases, because any autosomal dominant disorder that has a neurogenetic phenotype is likely to be a repeat. We've heard about Huntington's, we've heard about Fragilax, we've heard about Kennedy's disease, but there are several others. In Portugal, there's a second disease called Portuguese amyloidosis, which is a point mutation rather than expansion. It misfolds the protein, but accumulates in the liver, but also in peripheral nerves, and it causes a, just a devastating peripheral neuropathy, a sensory neuropathy, so you're not aware that you've injured yourself, and you get these terrible ulcer nails, and then you have to have a liver transplant. Well, this time last year, back-to-back -back articles in the New England Journal of Medicine talks about the safety and efficacy of RNA interference to knock down that mutant allele. Why that's so exciting is because it takes you off into the Alzheimer amyloid story, but also, if you look at Big Pharma, they have done everything in their power to um, make a new statin for hypercholesterolemia. They've bent the molecule seven days to Sunday and they can't, the patent's off. So they're looking for some other way to block that enzyme and they're very much heavily invested in RNA interference. So you're gonna see Huntington's fall, clinical trials are underway now in North America using RNA interference. And when it goes, a whole bunch of other diseases will go. Uh, and I'm hopefully I'll live long enough to see uh, some of the things happen. But on a more sobering note, I was at a meeting uh, a couple of weeks ago in Banff about these children with these lysosomal storage diseases. And there are 14 children in Canada with this one disease, and they're all on enzyme replacement. And as they get older, they need more enzyme by weight. And some of these children are consuming $600,000 a year. That's 300,000 pounds a year for one patient. Um, they're covered with some kind of orphan disease thing. But how long can that last? You know, how long can we? So I'm a bit concerned about the future with health economists saying this is not a good use of money, et cetera, et cetera. I, I, I can see why somebody would make that argument. So I see that as a future problem. But on the other hand, being an Irishman, my optimism and all that, more and more people are going outside the medical system. 
and spending money. I mean, $5,000 is not a lot of money to get a treatable diagnosis on your child. Canada, Canadians spend a billion dollars a year outside of the country for personalized medical care. It can be anything from a knee to an MRI to whatever. And the politicians are very frightened by that. So we're seeing the slow, steady rise of two-tier medicine in Canada, where you can get an MRI 10 days from now for 400 euros. That's not a lot of money. It's cheaper to get an MRI than fly to Toronto, for example. You know? People fly to Toronto all the time, they don't take much of it. So if you've got some terrible thing and you need an MRI, that, that's what I see. So I see these pushing and pulling. I was going around with my brother in Ireland and now in, in your country, I got looking at the headlines in the newspapers. And the headlines in the newspapers here are exactly the same headlines in the newspaper. Education and healthcare. Yeah. The doctors are yelling and screaming about the bureaucracy that's downsizing their attempts to help with the patients. And the schools are all in trouble. But you can go to the Globe and Mail or the National Post or the Times Colonist and get the same headline, same old, same old. 